What up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Nerd Gen Report, where we discuss the latest news and happening in the superhero genre. A lot to discuss. Um, I'm your host, Pablo, and joining me as always is Mr. Brian Schultz. Brian, what's going on? How you doing? Not too bad. Good to have Loki back. Good to have a lot of news on the tape. So it's yeah. uh, fun, fun times, and I've been watching a little bit of the Black Widow sort of featurettes they're putting up and counting down to... Uh, counting down to that in a couple of weeks as well where, where have you been watching those they're popping them up on uh youtube and i think through the disney sort of slash marvel entertainment official youtube they're just like a couple 60 second little looks and there was a a new trailer that was a canadian version that had some footage i hadn't seen before that how did it look I maybe gave you a look good but it gave you a little more sense of geography like that the focus is on the red room and kind of getting back to the red room and the taskmaster they said runs the red room now so that there's all little tidbits we hadn't heard um, about the storyline so i'm telling you but i mean look the action looks the action looks intense i will say this the little bits they're promoting florence Pugh looks like she might steal this movie did you see that little clip that they had where it was funny when she's like in the car <laughs> no 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 when i think they're in a store i don't know and she talks about is that your pose the pose that you do when she's like you, you remember that pose that oh, she yeah. did <laughs> that was hilarious yo you know uh, yeah they have her like wisecracking and making fun of her like yeah. all over the place yeah. it, it works you know so i'm kind of feeling like she might be the, the big winner of this film at least the way they're setting it up so yeah the future of the black widow is looking good and again i'm gonna say it once again if you haven't heard me say it before the black Widow is gonna be up there with the number one MCU film, which is the Winter Soldier, that I think is going to be up there, man. We should be getting reviews. You know, I, I don't know what I, I. Let's see. It should be in a week or two. I, I don't know how if they're gonna. If they, I don't think Marvel typically hasn't taken the review embargo right up to the release date. They like to kind of because they generally get good reviews. They like to kind of put it out there a few weeks early. So I wouldn't be shocked if in the next week or two we see some Something. actual reactions and reviews hitting on it. And that comes out. That comes to us July, July 9th. 9th. Okay, that's yeah. wow. That's one month. One yeah. more month. A lot of news to discuss. First up, Black Panther 2 is rumored to have cast uh, Tina Huerta, um, who, if you've seen as Namor, whom, whom you've seen as uh, in, in Narcos. I don't know if you've seen Narcos, Brian. Yeah, Narcos, Mexico. Yeah. He he's pretty he's a pretty good actor. Mm -hmm. Um very different choice from what I thought would be cast for Namor, but he's different, which is with Namor, you gotta cast somebody different. He can't look like anybody else. Right. So this is a, a, a pretty a pretty good casting. So this comes to us from comicbook.com, uh written by Charlie Ridgely. And I'll say this, we have gotten rumors about Black um, uh, Black Panther 2 and uh, Namor being in this film for quite some time. It was it's, it's, it has never been confirmed. This ha is not even a confirmation. This is a rumor, but most likely this is what's gonna happen. And we're, and we're slowly, getting closer to because remember black panther 2 releases next year so there isn't a lot of time we haven't gotten any talk about um um shooting dates or or i know ryan coogler has been writing it so they don't have a lot of time and this announcement sh surely um i guess gives us a little bit um uh, more comfort into thinking that you know Things are moving along. So from comicbook.com, everything about Marvel's Black Panther sequel remains a mystery, but the one persistent notion around the rumor mill is that the film will include Namor the Sub Submariner as its villain. As we all know, if you're a comic book head, Wakanda and the Atlanteans don't like each other. And Namor has always been a foe for the Black Panther. Um... According to the Illuminati, Mexican actor T Tina Cuerta will be taking on the role of Namor in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. 
Um, he's known again, as I've mentioned before, he was in Narcos and the Purge. Uh, of course, at this point in time, everything regarding Black Panther 2 is a rumor, as I just said. Nothing is official until it is revealed or confirmed by Marvel Studios. Given the release date for the new Black Panther movie, however, then that news should be coming sooner rather than later. Black Panther Wakanda Forever is currently scheduled to hit Jul July. 2022 that's just a little little over a year's away so so we're a little over a year away and uh we haven't gotten any confirmation of of, of, of um of when they were going to be shooting we've only gotten little tidbits here and there i i remember one rumor that um they were filming on the coast of australia so that sort of gives you some sort of hint possibly that there's going to be some ocean views coming in there, right? So we're certainly uh, gearing up towards, uh, and we've always said before, that Black Panther 2 has to be something to, in order to outdo the first, it has to introduce a character that the fans know and haven't seen yet. Remember, Unfortunately, Chadwick is no longer with us, so we're not going to see Black Panther. We might see someone take up the mantle, but we're not necessarily sure that um, Chichala is dead. We don't know that. We just know that that character has is not going to be recast and most likely not going to be in the movie. We're still waiting to see what this uh, um, homage to Chadwick will be. A lot of things, a lot of unknowns. What do you think of this possible cast of Namor and Black Panther 2 movie coming out next year? Well, we speculated on this. You know, we were trying to figure out what direction they would take this movie. And this rumor has been hanging out there because in the MCU, they've teased, right? This, they've made references to anomalies off the coast. And I think there was a map at one point that had a dot somewhere off the west coast of Africa, which sort of would have implied maybe that was Atlantis. So they've been teasing this for a while. And I think this is definitely a possible solution to the Black Panther 2, I don't want to call it a problem. That's that's not the right word, but the mm -hmm. void. Let's call it yeah. the void that was created when, when Chad would pass, which is to your point, sounds like Shuri is likely to take up the mantle, but you kind of, you do have to do some storytelling to, I think, both justify the need for that. Obviously, the absence of T'Challa, you have to explain that in a way that I think honors Chadwick's memory, but also leaves the door open for mm -hmm. T'Challa to return, because I do think that will happen later in the universe. And I think a critical element of setting up that longer term arc for his return is he needs a nemesis a real nemesis and i could argue i can already in my head i'm like all right so if you have this wakandan world they have this tradition of succession you know t'challa was the king he falls in some form disappears well, however they're going to write it their arch rival tries to take advantage of that in some way and you know comes on a conquest or it, it, there's a lot of natural things that yeah. i think help this story move forward yeah. from the unexpected passing of uh, of chadwick boseman so i think you could even i mean i wouldn't be i would not be upset for one if they in world building wakanda really spent a lot of time like if they yeah. made namor the real co-lead of this movie, not a small part, not an intro part, made him the co-lead of this movie, spent real time mm -hmm. with Marvel's version of Atlantis as a way to build out the world of Wakanda. Great, like in, like that's yeah. a new and different tack. And then you can bring it back around maybe in Black Panther 3 with a recast and sort of a, a showdown between, you know, they, a returned or rejuvenated or reincarnated T'Challa against, yeah. you know, against Namor. So a lot of ways you can go with this. I'm happy to see it. Yeah, like you said, kind of inspired casting because it's a little bit off the radar but i agree with you this is a character that shouldn't look like other heroes or villains so i think going with someone who's got some acting chops and you know has been in you know serious roles before and you give him sort of a bigger stage great that's the perfect that's usually where marvel does well when they cast this kind of 
yeah. actor actor someone on the rise who hasn't been given made the leap yet they usually do better with that he's also supposed to be showing up um heck the i mean uh tina cuerta is supposed to be showing up in the july the J- july 4th movie uh the purge i forget what the exact uh title of that movie is but he's going to be showing up in that film so you can get a better close uh, a better look at him there as well the, um, the purge franchise is a proud mcu tradition because i think Ethan <laughs> hawk was the star of the first and frank grillo was in a couple of them i think so yeah a lot, a lot of mcu characters find their way into the purge yeah. universe it seems. <laughs> and i'll say this before we move on that it was listen with regards to the Black Panther world and Nemesis and all that, it was either going to be Doom or this guy, Namor. Doom, I'm sure they're saving for the Fantastic Four introduction and that world. Yeah. So um, it's pretty li- it's pretty likely that we're going to see uh, Namor in Black Panther too. again because I I just think if in order to to get that success that they had the f- in the first one they have to go all out for the second one let us know in the comment section below what you, know, you think one about this thing possible that casting up. yeah I want to just add one other thing to that which is if this is true and if Namor is a frontline character in this movie this will come out five months before Aquaman 2 so you're going to have Namor on screen and Aquaman on screen five months apart. That actually was going to be kind of interesting to me. Oh yeah, it's, right. It's the it's two ver- it's the Marvel and DC version of effectively the same char- character. Definitely the, the underwater character and Atlantis. Definitely, I, it's, it, they rarely have gone head to head that close before. It's going to be interesting to see the dynamics in terms of how they make things look in Namor or That's with. What I mean. That's what I mean. The stuff that happens underwater and how they do it over there at DC is going to be very interesting to see. And by the way, Avatar 2 is coming next December too. So get ready Ooh. for a lot of time in the water. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Because Jane Cameron, when he does stuff, he makes it look dope. So that's going to be, wow. That's going to be something to see right there. Next up. New photos show Mark Ruffalo on the She-Hulk set. Um, This comes to us from Heroic Hollywood, written by Terry Griffith. Um, Originally announced in 2019, it was initially unclear how the She-Hulk Disney Plus series would connect to the rest of the Hulk canon. Late last year, it was revealed that Mark Ruffalo and Abomination actor Tim Raw would be joining the series. I heard that as well. It is currently unknown how big of a role the two characters will have, but at least one of the actors has had this picture had his picture taken on set. Uh, in the photo, Mark Ruffalo can be seen in the motion capture suit he has used in the previous films for the role of the Incredible Hulk with actress Anais Almonte, whose role has not been disclosed. I think she's probably going to be Miss America. Um, you can see the full image below. Um, yeah, I think she, that that character is going to be probably be Miss America. She looks the part. Um, Abomination, I don't know what role he'll play. Most likely, I think maybe he'll be sort of one of those characters that, who knows, maybe get a hint of possible Thunderbolt, Thunderbolt's inclusion. You know, we never know if we might see uh, what's... Um, What's her name? She was in uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Um, oh, Sharon Carter, you mean? No. Ju- oh, Ju- um, Ju- uh, Julie Louis-Dreyfus. Yes, Contessa. yes, Contessa. We might see her in her recruiting mode. Who knows? Um, you guys already know how I feel about Mark Ruffalo and his Hulk portrayal. We already know that Marvel, and most people, uh, I think, would agree that the whole character, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't say, um, has been destroyed, but they haven't done a very good job with um, this character. Brian, you and I have had She Hulk the series. I think you and I agree that is number eight on our list. Um, what are your thoughts? The, with this um, information that we, I mean, we already knew that the Hulk was going to be in this show uh, because how else will she be 
um, to, will she turn into the She-Hulk? It's going to be through whatever transfusion, whatever, whatever event happens where he has to give her blood. Um, I still remain down on this on this on this show what are your thoughts yeah no i i think as i've said look mark ruffalo has to be in this show um which i think will only underscore the need for marvel to find a new way to portray jennifer walters on screen as compared to professor hulk yeah as we said the the the, the main comic book difference with she hulk is that she hulk can maintain her sort of intelligence and human persona while she's the hulk which is yeah. exactly what mark ruffalo was doing in endgame already yeah. yeah so you have if you have two of the same character the show is already going to fail so i think you have to find a way to make those different and if they're going to be in the same show together you're naturally going to compare them so i'm skeptical as you i mean look we just Hulk hasn't worked, uh, you know, really, really worked the way that Marvel would have hoped um, in any form or fashion, no matter what they've tried so far. So I'd be surprised if this show is the one that gets them over the hump. But um, but I didn't think there was any way you could get through this show without Mark Ruffalo doing a handoff of some kind. So now we have that confirmation, it would seem that he will be he will be doing that. And I guess the only question now is I assume he is professor hulk minus an arm is that pretty much what we're that what hulk we're and this that hulk and the sling thing had me going crazy i still think about it and, and like get disgust the hulk in a in, <laughs> it's just it just doesn't work i'm sorry it just doesn't work let us know what you guys think in the comment section below about she hulk and uh are you excited about this show let us know in the well, I think other things too is we've had three Marvel shows on the board now, or two full ones and a, and a premiere. Mm -hmm. And you start to think about what is in the pipeline, and you can see where the bar is being set. And it's not a perfect bar, as we said. Marvel's had issues with the shows, but it's a pretty high bar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, yeah. I look at this show, and I'm like, what is the version of this show that exceeds the bar that's been set? And for those of you commenting, I'd be I'd be love to hear like. Give, you know what's an iteration or a version of this show where you walk out of there saying like this is the one i want season two of more than falcon and the winter soldier more than loki which apparently already has second season. that i struggle yeah. with it I, I don't see it yeah uh, this will probably be one of those ones that doesn't get a second season right i i i just yeah, don't, I, I, i'd be surprised i'd be surprised i'm this was this is one that i'm going to be surprised if there's a huge audience for it. yeah yeah, I agree. Uh, next up, um, this come from uh, comes to us from Dark Horizons, written by Garth Franklin. Um, Keanu, Hart, The Rock, Krasinski, they're gonna be they're gonna provide their voice for DC's uh, Super Pets. This. Let me first read a little bit of this article. The highly impressive voiceover cast of the animated feature DC League of Super Pets has been announced via teaser video released on Dwayne Johnson's social media pages. I'm, I doubt anyone had any objections with, with <laughs> The Rock posting anything uh, about this. Um, the film will follow the antics of the pets of DC superheroes. Johnson will voice Crypto the Superdog alongside Kevin Hart as Ace. Also on board are Kate McKinnon, Vanessa Bayer, John Krasinski, Diego Luna, Natasha Leone, and Keanu Reeves. Uh, which of that group will be playing which characters is unclear. In the comics, the super pets range from Aquaman's seahorse, Storm to Harley Quinn's hyenas, Bud and Lou to Flexi the plastic bird and Comet the super horse. Uh, Writer-director Jaron Jared Stern is behind the feature which has set has a set theatrical release of uh, May 20th 2022 obviously this is for the kids to go this is this is DC playing their Disney card their Pixar card get the family to go to the movie theaters together and and rack up on box office numbers this could work. 
this could work. I may even go to the theaters to see it. Why? Because I have a kid. <laughs> so other than that, I'm I, I I I'm not really too interested in seeing this. But you know, Disney got to do what they they got to try to get money from all sorts of angles. The way Disney's doing it. What are your thoughts on this? I think it's gonna be a big hit. I'm not gonna disagree with you on that. I think they. I think this is a corner that granted it's because of the comics but it's the corner that they're getting to before marvel is and it's a great corner because of what you just said kids love animals yeah and kids love superheroes yeah so superhero animals <laughs> i mean that yeah so it just I, works i got i got lots of jokes but i was gonna say i want to congratulate dwayne johnson on his dc franchise you got it it's done mark it in super pets 2 super pets 3 is happening yeah you, oh wait you, know you wanted what? that for black adam my bad <laughs> you right i think this is gonna work it's a great cast it's a great cast you know and the thing is they actually have comic book storylines to draw from right this whole the heroes have been incapacitated so the pets have to step in i mean it's gold, I think, for, for for what it needs to be, right? It's gold for kids. It's gold for a family friendly outing where you're like, you know, super powered. I mean, we get a Paw Patrol movie coming this summer, okay? Mm -hmm. This is this is the thing. This is Mighty Pups on steroids. Like that's, that's what it is. And I, I just don't see how it fails. I actually think it'd be pretty good. I will say this: <laughs> Is it bad? I kind of want to see Zack Snyder direct this. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see the R rating. <laughs> it's gonna. It would be a lot of limbs being torn off by, yeah, exactly, by crypto. Exactly. But I want to see. What I'm interested in seeing is what happens. How do who captures all the superheroes or incapacitates them Fair. under what circumstance? That's gonna be interesting to see. I, I, I you know, I, I'll watch it for that to just see how they get incapacitated and how the super pets are gonna be able to help. In, in this, I'm, I'm pretty sure we're gonna see Superman. That's gonna be interesting to see what they look like, right? I mean, I mean, I know there. What would you put odds that this is the highest grossing DC movie of 2022? So it would have to beat Aquaman too. I don't know if it beats Aquaman too. I definitely yeah, it's does. Tough. I mean, yeah, it does it does well, but I don't know if it beats. The, I'll be surprised as hell if it does. Well, you probably need Aquaman two to come down. Like I think if Aquaman two does one 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 two again, it's probably not getting to that level. But if Aquaman two was like a seven hundred fifty million dollar global movie, do you think this could get there if the reviews were good for it? I, th I mean, yeah, big I, animated films when they get rolling. You know, the, the kids want to see him three, four, five times, you know, so there's a chance. I I, that's, I was trying to think, like, I don't think it's got a billion dollars on it, but like 600, 700 million, like something better than like something Man of Steel or higher, but with obviously a much lower budget. Like, I think it's in play. It's it, it's an idea that ought, if it doesn't work, it will be another black eye for DC. This is why yeah, I think it's kind yeah. of hard to yeah. really mess up. Yeah. Um, let us know in the comment section below what you guys think of this superhero ensemble super pets I, I think they, they, may, they may have a winner even though you know I'm not very tr necessarily interested in it but I'm pretty sure there's going to be a lot of reluctant parents possibly not even reluctant but they're going to be taking their kids not once but probably twice let's see yeah that's why yeah yeah um Next up, DC's upcoming Blue Beetle film may be heading to HBO Max. This comes to us, to us from Heroic Hollywood, written by Trey Griffith. Uh, the state of the DC Extended Universe seems to be in constant flux. That is correct. Since the critical failures and box office out in the performance of both Batman vs. Superman, Dawn of Justice, and Justice League, many projects for the shared universe have been started, canceled, or remain in a state of limbo. One such film has sadly been a Blue Beetle film. The first re first revealed back in late 2018 news on the upcoming Blue Beetle film had been hard to come by. The project then had new life breathed into it when seemingly out of nowhere, Angel Manuel Soto was hired to direct the film with production being eyed to start in late fall. 
But now, the upcoming film may, may skip its theatrical run in favor of an HBO Max release. Brian, I think this is the only way to go with Blue Beetle. I get it. Depending on which uh, version of Blue Beetle they want to go with, I tend to think that they'll probably go with the Hispanic version. Um, just to be the first, you know, just to be number the first people to do or whatever the case may be, the first superhero, whatever. But I don't think there are a lot of fans out there for a theatrical release that's going to make them depend uh, what it also depends on how much money they put into this right i would assume there's going to be a lot of uh 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 what's it called jesus my, why don't my mind go blank sometimes um visual effects that are going to have to be applied and and and, and it's going to cost for blue beetle I think this is go to HBO. This is the, the HBO Max is the way to go. What do you think? Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I think the question I would just have for you is, what do you think about the what seems to be almost like a Netflix approach to DC properties on HBO Max? There's not a lot of like we think about the way Marvel is doing this, right? There's a real system. There's a real systematic approach. There's a connectivity. They're really specific about the veins they're drawing from TV to movie. Like also, this is much more like you know Netflix hits you within the genre. Here's 20 original projects, and the, we trust the audience to find the one that works. Like yeah. this looks a little bit more like that, right? Because you got Blue Beetle, you've got Green Lantern, you've got Peacemaker. You you know we're gonna talk about Zatanna in a second. You got Static Shock. I mean. You got um, the incumbent and like Titans. There's really no connection, right? This, we're all over the map. We're just putting properties onto this service. Yeah. Uh, and if you subscribe, you have a you know a growing and very large menu. It would seem of properties to choose from. W what do you think about that idea? Do you think it hurts or helps them to just have that sort of variety menu out there? Uh, I think it helps because of the environment that they're in, which is the streaming wars. They have to have content that get people curious enough to want to click. And if it's good, there'll be other stuff that they can watch. Um, so I think it's good in that regard. The concern or the problem that I have with, I don't know if this is a universe per se. Right. Um, I don't know if there is any connection. I don't know if there, these storylines or these 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 shows are going to be connected in any way. And I don't know how where they'll end up. So with these sort of characters, I think it only helps if you put it on the streaming platform rather than go theatrical with this. I think the other thing too that I'm curious about is. Now we said with the merger, the new executives are not calling the shots, but I do wonder if there are tighter pocketbooks between now and when the deal closes. So if you have an asset, which you're not sure deserves the theatrical treatment, they're going to downshift the budget and push it to HBO max. I, I would tend to think that's the safer route versus, Hey, here's, 175 million dollars to budget a blue beetle film and now we need to advertise this and promote it and it's got to make 600 million dollars for us to really make have call it a success it's like yeah I, I just think if in doubt most of these are probably headed for hbo max and then the argument would be if one of them hits the new management could always opt to do more with it they could always opt to bring it back to theaters for the sequel or turn it into a series or do whatever they want with it so I do wonder if there's a little bit of that invisible hand, you know, kind of behind the scenes, really being tighter with betting on what they think it's are the sure things yeah. uh, as far as what to put into the theater. I mean, they're also contemplating of doing Bat Batgirl on HBO Max as well, correct? Right. And I didn't even mention the Gotham series as well. So that's what I mean by like, there's a lot of universe yeah. that isn't really connected. And to your point, I think the short answer is you can't, 
we can read rumors all we want and I'm tuning all of them out because the reality is new management is going to make new decisions likely with new personnel. So the short answer is there is no possible way you can tell me that DC knows what its universe is going to look like in 2022, 2023 at this point. Yeah. I would be interested if these shows are successful that they do possibly a young justice version uh, movie. That could be something interesting. Interesting if these other characters do work on HBO Max and if they're popular, why not go that route if, if that's the case? But let's see. It's still a lot. It's still early to tell. Uh, let us know in the comment section below what you think of whether Blue Beetle, Blue Beetle needs to be on the big screens, which I don't think it'll work. I don't, I don't think it makes sense. Um, or does it need to go on HBO Max, which I think they're leaning towards. Uh, next up, Satana writer Emerald Fennel wants to make DC Project big and scary. Emerald Fennel has become the talk of the town after winning Best Original Screenplay at the Oscars for Promising Young Woman. Shortly after her win, she was brought on board by DC to pen a Zatanna film. No director is currently attached, but many are speculating that she'll eventually take on that role herself. In an interview with Empire, Fennel opened up about penning the DC project and how the darkness of the character excited her. There are a lot of, and I quote, there are a lot of things about her that felt like they could be really, really interesting, and it'll be an opportunity to make something really quite dark. At that appeal, and that appealed to me to make something big and scary. I love that stuff. This sort of makes sense with Satana. You see, you have magic. Um, and that's pretty much all I know about the character because I've seen it only in uh, the Justice League animated series um, and in Justice League Dark. And from watching Justice League Dark, there's a lot of big and scary things that happen there. So, and to bring, bring that on film, it'll be very interesting to see how dark they go and, and do they make this a scary? Because, I, you know, we're already getting something sort of big and scary with Doctor Strange 2 and uh, Multiverse of Madness and DC may also want to dive into that uh, genre in terms of superhero horror um, on, on their end. What do you think? Yeah, you hit on it. I was going to say like this is the, you know, they've got to find an avenue which is not quite Scarlet Witch, right? They have to find something that's, and the characters are not. I mean, they're, they're, there's some linkages through magic, but they're not written the same. So they need to be careful that this does not wind up being compared too much to Doctor yeah. Strange and Scarlet, especially because Doctor Strange and, and WandaVision leaned us into the magic, right? The magic side of this is really supposed to seemingly going to get amped up in, in Doctor Strange too. So Zatanna is a character where magic has always been sort of at the forefront. So I, I think that's going to be the challenge. I, I mean, Emerald Fennel though, I, I mean, to her credit, was pretty upfront about the the other attraction of this which is the way of the world now which is you start out as the you know you do the you do the smaller film the critically acclaimed film maybe you get nominated for an award or two and then you jump onto one of these because you now have the brand name recognition that the network or the studio wants and you get a lot more money yeah. to uh to budget and write and play with and she acknowledged that she's like look i mean to be able to write this stuff and think about it in a storyboard but then know that the budget i have to work with is many times what i had for promising young woman yeah i mean that's obviously a huge part of this but that's that's how it goes now you do you, you don't have to wait 10 films to get these shots like you do kind of one one acclaimed film and you're making the leap already into into these types of projects so we'll see yeah yeah um let us know in the comment section below what you guys think of satana and it being dark uh, a dark film. Uh, it, it only it no no again. We can say, or some people may say, this is not a competition. It is, man. It is. Well, it's a comp competition for eyeballs. It's yeah. Competition for exactly. subscriber dollars. Exactly. Like time. That's exactly. Really yeah. Yeah. So I mean, and especially too that they, you know they're operating in the same realm. So they're going to do what's working, I guess, in other places. And they're going to try to apply some so, sort of the similar with a tweak or two of their own version of it. So um, it's like the Kung Fu movies. 
<laughs> you know what I'm saying? Bruce Lee was a was a huge success, and everything else was a derivative of that. Yeah, I mean, look, people they focus on it because of the comics, but like step back and think about your TV experience. TV shows and dramas, what are they? They're about cops. They're about hospitals. They're about yeah. lawyers. And every network has a version of that show, and they go head to head, and you know, a couple of them rise to the top. This is what TV is. Yeah, yeah. Now, I will say this. Now, I think you probably feel the same. I'm, a, I'm more interested in this than I am in Batgirl. If you're saying like a female frontline projects for HBO Max, I, I just yes. think like Batgirl feels like ground we've been over before. Yes, yes, yes. This yes, at yes, least yes, yes. has some optionality for something. New. Totally different, yes. Totally different and new. I agree with you 100% on that. I'm sort of... I'm almost fatigued of the Batman universe. Somewhat. Especially when Batman is not involved. Um. Next up. Ryan Reynolds hints work on Deadpool 3 with mysterious photo. I'm pretty sure everybody has seen the photo. I mean, in a, in, this comes to us from Heroic Hollywood uh, from by Noah Villaverde. In a new photo posted on his Instagram story, Ryan Reynolds showcased an open bag with Deadpool's mask exposed. No context, no context was given to the to this specific post. But it's hard to believe that he's teasing work on Deadpool 3. There's been a lot of talk as of late, Brian, regarding Deadpool 3. The rated R thing, uh, how much control does Ryan Reynolds has or Kevin has around this whole thing? Is Disney gonna really do this rated R thing? Listen, we haven't heard anything regarding them not working with Ryan Reynolds. Ryan Reynolds is going to be Deadpool. He's going to be a part of the MCU. How much? We don't know yet. But they're certainly moving forward with Deadpool 3. How they're going to pull this off, it being a rated R uh, film, and how closely it's going to be associated with Disney is still yet to be determined. That relationship or that connectivity. Brian, do you think, or do you, when do you think we're going to get some sort of announcement regarding Deadpool 3? Uh, I would guess when is D23 this year? That'd be my guess. It's in the fall. Is, 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 yeah, usually around August, it, September. The schedules have all changed because of, of COVID. I think it's usually we was in the fall. Maybe it's a little later fall this year. I think that's the logical place to bring him out on stage or virtual stage and um and the other thing i would also point out is they've got that they've got the um avengers campus yes which just opened and is obviously in high demand and the way deadpool likes to market like that's also a perfect like meta way to almost drop him into the crowd there or something you know like do some play on that so I, that's kind of what I, I think we're close i think we're pretty i think we're pretty close I just want to point out with the R-rated thing. So the the fixation is Disney, the castle logo with Disney attached to it is not associated with the R-rated property. Touchstone Pictures back in the 80s and 90s mm -hmm. was a Disney sub subsidiary. Okay. It didn't have the mouse house, but like, I'm just going to say, okay, Touchstone Pictures was the studio behind The Rock on air yeah enemy of the state yeah they've made plenty of r-rated movies they just haven't done it with the mouse and the castle on the front so it, it, it will survive so, yeah you know, the control thing is the more interesting question that's the, the knowing right where ryan reynolds has gotten to status wise mm -hmm. and obviously where how kevin likes to work and the parliament likes to work that i think is the more interesting question that remains yeah. to be answered but. yeah that, that 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 is very very interesting to see what kevin is or the parliament is going to read when they're reading his script or his ideas or his jokes or whatever in this in this in, in the film it's like now nah, we can't do this i mean 
that dynamic there is very interesting and in how it will go. Eventually, obviously, they'll, they'll work it out. But Ryan Reynolds, you know, he knows he has to play ball or else, or else Deadpool is, is gone forever for him. Right, so he has to play ball with Kevin in the MCU because they're 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 the top dogs and they're running stuff. So it's like you either and we own it, (laughs) but we want you to play it. But we have to play within these confines and not deviate too far outside of it, or else we're gonna have issues. There's some pretty high expectations here. I mean, it's interesting. Deadpool two was just about as critically acclaimed as Deadpool one, but. The box office was about the same as well. It, it didn't really rise, you know. It didn't step up. It was pretty yeah. much the same. And so, yeah. I think you, you know, I think there's some expectation that you put this under the Marvel, um, the MCU umbrella with Disney, and this ought to be a billion dollar property, even with the R rating. Yeah. And, and so, I think there's some real expectation. And Ryan Reynolds realizes that. Like this is what, this is what allows him to get paid by Netflix to do all the others. Like this, this franchise has to keep working for him. For him to be then be able to do all the other stuff and still be you know at the top of the a-list where he's been the last couple of years yeah um let us know in the comment section below what you think of uh this deadpool non-announcement or hint of uh, of it the ball starting to roll on this project uh are you excited for it and uh, what do you think is going to happen um are we going to get a watered down deadpool let us know in the comment section below and in our segment that we promised from last week oh really (laughs) you don't say segment jj abrams says or reflects this comes from us this comes to us from collider by adam chitwood jj abrams reflects on star wars star wars and when it's critical to have a plan he says and i quote you just never really know But having a plan, I have learned, in some cases, the hard way is the most critical thing because otherwise you don't know what you're setting up. You don't know what to emphasize because if you don't know the inevitable of the story, you're just as good as your last sequence or effect or joke or whatever, but you want to be leading to something inevitable. What I understand from this, Brian, I don't think, and this is just me, him openly saying this, and whomever he was working with on getting this done, that they didn't have enough respect for the Star Wars franchise to really understand what needed to be done, what story needed to be told. If you were be, if you were, if you were being hired to do a trilogy. You need what you need to know what those three films are going to be and where it's going to start and where it's going to end. They did not have a plan. To me, that shows. I'm sorry to say it. It shows to me that they didn't have enough respect for 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 Star Wars and the storyline and and what this needed to be, and they failed. I wouldn't say they failed miserably in terms of box office because they made money. I think each of those made a billion dollars, correct? Oh yeah, it was two billion, you know, one and a half, and you know, just like one one. Once you get to a billion, you you're successful. You're successful. Once you get there, you're successful. But the fans weren't happy with what um what product they, they turned out. And I'll read something else because this Adam Chitwood says some crazy stuff that doesn't really make sense. Um J.J. Abrams was never supposed to direct more than one film in the Star Wars franchise. When he was first approached about tackling episode seven, he turned it down. It it took some convincing on then new Lucasfilm head Kathleen Kennedy's part to get Abrams to agree to sign on. And in doing so, Abrams said at the time that he was excited about the idea of creating a foundation from the ground up from which other stories might grow. Indeed, The Force Awakens had the an enviable task of introducing brand new characters that fans would want to follow while also serving fans desires to see old favorites back on the screen abrams co-writing the script with lawrence kasdan after michael ardent 
wrote the initial draft, pulled it off, not only providing a satisfying conclusion to Han's solo arc, but also making the world fall in love with Ray, Finn, Poe, and BB-8. That last line, but also making the world fall in love with Ray, Finn, and Poe, I don't think people fell in love with those characters. Especially not Finn. Especially not Poe. And even Ray, I don't think fans fell in love with those characters. I think fans had a lot to say about those characters, but they weren't in love with those characters. What are your What are your thoughts on this article and what J.J. Abrams said? I mean, everyone associated with this trilogy treats it like a radioactive kyber crystal at this point. <laughs> I mean, everybody when they get interviewed, when they go on podcasts, they go on TV, it is like, wait, let me wash my hands. It wasn't me. It's like <laughs> the Quint, it's the Quentin Tarantino scene where everyone pulls a gun on the other character. That's that. They're all pointing their fingers at everyone else. It wasn't. Look, I mean, let's let's break this down. Okay, so JJ's first point: generally better to have a plan. I mean, yeah, duh. I mean, <laughs> so what is the what is the okay? What is a plan, right? I think a plan in movie context and movie parlance is not three scripts end to end detail. All it is really is the general beats of where you need to get to, like episode seven, eight, and nine. Where do we generally want to be at the start of episode seven? Where do we generally want to be at the start of episode eight? And where do we want to be at the start of episode nine at the end of the trilogy? As long as you have that framework, you can then write and create and rewrite and do all the stuff that normally happens in a movie in between. I mean, heck, it's not fair to compare the original Star Wars because George Lucas never knew he was going to get a chance to make a second one. So he wrote the first one as a self-contained movie, even though, yeah, he clearly had ideas beyond that, but it was a struggle to get one made. And so, you know, we talk about no plan plan. There's a lot of debate as to whether George really knew Luke and Leia were sisters in, in that first movie, given they kiss a lot. And there's a lot of romantic and sexual tension between them. And then obviously it, it gets resolved in a, family way by the, mm-hmm, by the third mm-hmm, movie. Mm-hmm. So you could argue George didn't have a plan when he started out. But like I said, he also had no knowledge there would be a sequel. In this mm-hmm. case, Disney knew the money would be there to make three movies. So that would allow them to, to map it out. So yes, having a plan is good. Now having a bad plan is no better than having no plan. I do want to point this out because there's mm-hmm. plenty of franchises that have never gotten off the ground that have made their first movie and said, this is the first movie of six. Mm-hmm. Uh, Charlie Hunnam did a King Arthur movie with Guy Ritchie that was like, we have six movies planned out. Yeah, the first movie stunk. So <laughs> who cares what your plan was for two through six, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. a bad plan is no better than no plan. But I think for something like this, what they wound up with was like two steps forward, three steps back, one step forward, two steps back. And they were all over the place with this. And you bring up the key point, which is, you don't really need to map. I mean, you need to map out the general arcs, especially for your new characters. Like we know who Han Solo is. Okay. You can kind of do what you, I don't want to say you can do what you want, but Harrison Ford's going to make it look good. Yeah. yeah. He is. Yeah. Same with Mark Hamill, like Mark Hamill saying, Oh, I disagree completely with how Luke was portrayed in last year. Fine. But you know what? He still played the part really well, yeah. but you don't really leave the movie hating Mark Hamill, but with a new character, you have to make us care. Yeah. And so what they did is, I think they kind of got there with Ray. I think my experience, at least being around kids and stuff like that, is Ray to them is what Luke and Leia were to a lot of kids in the eighties. Yeah, because of you know, her, her action and her sort of progression as a Jedi. But you're right, Finn and Poe were just shunted to the side as the trilogy went on, given nothing to do. We didn't care what they what their backgrounds were. They really weren't heading anywhere. They fit, had fits and spurts where they would pop up, but it almost felt like they were being shoehorned into the main plot. Yeah. When in the first movie, at least, there were some seeds planted for like, oh, there's going to be a meaningful relationship. Yeah. And, oh, he's an ex-stormtrooper. There's some something there that could be... And none of that paid off. So yeah. I really think it failed those characters in particular. Um, and then obviously, like, Rise of Skywalker was just a, a, a poster child for when you let the fans dictate 
too much of the outcome and you try to please everyone, you wind up pleasing no one, which again yeah. is a captain obvious statement. I mean, that's always been the case. So, yeah. um, you know, I, as I said, I just, I'm always, I'm just sort of dumbfounded at the, the amount of people who just, you know, want to kind of dump all over these movies and just distance themselves as much as they possibly can from this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, it's, yeah, there, it's not great. I think it was by and large disappointing, but to your perspective, this is not, you know, this is not um, like, what well, it's like Ishtar, Heaven's Gate, or like the worst movies of all time. It's not yeah. that. No. Yeah. <laughs> but, 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 Brian, this is Star Wars. And I think there was a, an expectation for these movies to be somewhat great. And, and and not having this feeling of disappointment at the end of them. So can I ask the question? Okay, so I agree with you that that was the perception. Here's my question. Why? There hasn't been a truly great Star Wars movie since 1980. Since, well, the, uh, since Empire Strikes Back? I'm saying that's like a transcendent film. Return of the Jedi is a very fun, acceptable film. Yeah. Very good. Very good yeah. film. Very enjoyable. But mm -hmm. not, I wouldn't consider it all time great. No. It but... suffers actually, it actually suffers from some of the same things that hit the new trilogy, right? Some of this duplication, right? Another Death Star of fly inside, blow it. There's a little bit of similarity <laughs> there. It's just executed better so you don't notice it as much. Yeah. Um, the Ewoks, like, you know, you can take it or leave it with them. But I'm saying, you know, we went through this with the prequels. True. The, the Revenge of the Sith was... Well, it was good, underrated. Underrated, but it's not all-time... There's no all-time great film. In those but it was... So that's why I'm saying, why did we expect this? George couldn't pull it off himself when he was given the full control. Was this trilogy worse than that trilogy start to finish? I don't no, think so. No, no, no. It wasn't. But so the issue is the issue. So, yeah, there are clearly issues here, but the code that they weren't able to crack has been an issue for 30 or 25 years now. Yeah. But I guess for me, the newness of it all and the continuation of it all, I was expecting better learning from the mistakes of the prequels and I guess building something new for the next generation. It didn't live up to the original trilogy. No, no, that, no not even close. I'm not, I'm not arguing that. And so I was expecting more. You know, we had Scott, Luke Skywalker in there and I don't think his arc was bad, but for the new characters, I mean, like in the original Star Wars and even in the prequels, there were characters that you remembered and loved. Obi Wan, um, obviously Princess Leia, Han Solo, Boba Fett. This, but in this series of movies that we were given. I don't care for any of them pretty much. So, yeah. So this is, this is going to go down to discussion on a couple of points. I do think the, so the original trilogy had one obvious benefit that none of the other movies that came after it had, which was there was no universe. There was no canon. There was nothing that the audience went into the movie believing was supposed to happen. So yeah. everything you took in, you could accept at face value as the pure creation of Lucas. And then the, he handed off the director reign. So they actually had three directors in the original trilogy, Irving Krishna, Richard Marquand did the second and the third one. I do think that's a big advantage mm -hmm. because it allows you to, to define these characters in the way you want without having people saying, yeah, but, but look over there in that show and in that comic and in that book the characters shown differently and i wanted to see that 
Mm-hmm. In, a, in, a, in a way, Star Wars now is much more like a Marvel comic or a DC comic because there's such a rich text mm-hmm. of stories that have been written around these characters. And what surprises me, if you're asking me, is that Disney not only didn't use those, but went mm-hmm. so far as to literally say that's not canon anymore. To literally say that your experience in the Star Wars universe for 20 years, 30 years since the George Lucas days has been invalidated and we're doing something completely different yeah. i wonder if they had that over again whether they might have gone the other way and taken more of the marvel approach which is we don't need to recreate timothy zahn's novels but we could definitely pull characters and storylines that are unilaterally loved and bring them in because oh by the way that's what the mandalorian's doing and everyone <laughs> likes it so yeah. I'm, I'm just saying, like, I, it is a fundamental choice that whether it was Kathleen Kennedy or whoever it was that was in that room mm-hmm. that said, you know what, we're going to scrap all that and go in a whole new direction, big risk. And yeah. it, that, I think, might be at the root of why we feel the way we feel right now about, yeah. about the movies. I'll end it up by saying this. The way I felt about it at the end of this trilogy was when Ralphie found out in Christmas Story that that deco- that secret decoder ring was a crummy commercial. It just ruined the excitement after seeing what Palpatine, really? That's what you came up with. Palpatine. Would you agree that you were not excited even before you sat down in the theater for that movie? Is that fair? That you I was went to see. You went to see it because you had to go see it, basically, not because you were like itching to go see it. And this was the, the. Are you referring to the last film of that trilogy? Rise of Skywalker. Yeah, in part because when they when they teased that Palpatine was coming back, for me it like took my excitement down. It didn't make it go up. It was fun to see the actor do the voice again when I saw the announcement. But yes, uh, the excitement level in terms of... At first, when I saw the the announcement, I was like, yo, this dude is still alive? Poplin is is still... But how? You know, so the curiosity of wanting to know how this, you know, turns out was there. Excitement, probably not so much. Curiosity, a lot more. So I was curious, but yeah. certainly not excited. Yeah, no, I, I bring it up because I think my experience watching Rise of Skywalker was very detached. Like, I didn't find it horrendous, but I just didn't go in. And I will say, even with Revenge of the Sith, as bad as Attack of the Clones had been, I was still, like, edge of my seat stoked because I knew that in Revenge of the Sith we were getting the showdown. Yeah. By which he would become Darth Vader. That that yeah. alone kept yeah. me that was... in the game. So when it opened, I was there opening night and I was excited. Even yeah. though I felt like the second movie had kind of been like, oh my God, this is yeah. this is pretty pretty <laughs> awful. So whereas with this one, I went in with just not a lot of steam. I kind yeah. of was there because I was like, well I come this far, I might as well see how yeah. it goes. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Definitely, I think a lot of people felt that way, and I, I and I think although it was excitement for many with you know it being Star Wars and and, and a new installment and where the story was gonna go, it's certain they they just it's like watching Michael Jordan go for a shot, you know, two seconds left and there's a freaking air ball, you know, it's like oh man, that's the way I felt. Anyway, that's our show for today. Please let us know in the comment section below what uh, you think of any of our discussions uh, that we had today regarding some of the news that we had coming out. Brian, any last words? No, I mean, just uh, we're we're into the summer season. Loki is off and running. We're a month away from Black Widow. So the first MCU film we've had since Endgame, I guess, finally is going to be here. Man, it feels like a long... A lot longer than two years. Lots happened in two years, that's for sure. 
has your uh, number in terms of percentage changed in terms of going to the theaters to go see the Black Widow? Yeah, it, it keeps going up. To be quite honest, it keeps going up. I just, I just don't know if I can hold out, and I, I really, I'm really missing the theater, and I really want to go back and see something. And I know that's the kind of movie that, you know, is meant to be seen on a big screen. Yeah, so yeah. I'm, I'm leaning toward maybe trying to do it. Have, have the second tickets gone on sale for that yet? Not yet, right? I haven't even checked. I haven't yeah. checked. Well, yeah, that's our show for today, ladies and gentlemen. Please uh, let us know. Please hit that like and subscribe button, share it with your friends, um, and uh, comment in the comment section below. It really does help support this channel. And we'll see you next time on the Nerd Gen Report.